Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan and the Mandalorian is finally back after a two year hiatus. Book of Boba Fett was just a side quest for Din Djarin to get a new ship and his baby Gogur back. And so I thought it'd be a great time to do a video about all of the various factions in Mandalorian lore. If you've been watching any of the recent trailers for season three, you'll get a sense that the Mandalorians are gonna try to do what they've been trying to do for quite some time now, and that's unite as a people and reclaim their broken world of Mandalore. This'll be a great feat and a huge challenge, not only because the Empire left their planet cratered and irradiated, but also because of the very complex Mandalorian culture and the various factions and groups that make up the Mandalorian diaspora. It should be noted that a Mandalorian clan or house is different from their faction. It's not uncommon to see Mandalorians of the same clan in various factions. For instance, Pre Vizsla is a member of the Death Watch, whereas Paz Vizsla is a member of the Children of the Watch. In both Disney canon and in the original Star Wars Legends, Death Watch was a very important faction, but also a very controversial faction within Mandalorian lore. There are some that see Death Watch as the true successors of the original legacy of Mandalore, and that's because uh, in both Legends and in canon, Death Watch was started by Clan Vizsla. In canon, it's Concordia Governor Pre Vizsla who starts the organization, and in Legends, it's Tor Vizsla. So Pre Vizsla claims a direct blood lineage to Tar Vizsla, who is the founder of his house and clan. Tar Vizsla was a rare Mandalorian with force sensitivity, and he was sent to the Jedi Temple at a young age where he excelled in his training. He would forge a unique lightsaber known as the Darksaber, and he would one day return to Mandalore and unite his people with it. The Darksaber would become a sign of Mandalorian leadership, and those who won it through combat had a rightful claim to the Mandalorian throne. Even those who hated the Death Watch couldn't deny the importance that Clan Vizsla had in Mandalorian history. Speaking of those detractors, a large minority, I would say, view Death Watch as a cancerous organization that has led the Mandalorians to their downfall on numerous occasions. You see, Death Watch really embodies the traditional Mandalorian way which we see more fleshed out in Legends. Back in those days, the Mandalorians were known for going on glorious crusades where they would invade and challenge various species and massacre those who they found unworthy. These guys were vicious. They once beat the sentients out of a race of dragon aliens. Unlike traditional empires or federations, the Mandalorian Crusades had very few political or territorial goals. Instead, what these Mandalorians pursued was glory and combats and worthy opponents. The Mandalorians weren't soldiers, they were warriors. They embrace and enjoyed chaos and warfare, and that is ultimately what got the entire galaxy turned against them. No one really enjoyed their behavior. Eventually, the Mandalorians took on more than they could handle and would be defeated by the Republic and the Jedi or the Empire. Death Watch didn't want to learn from the mistakes of their ancestors who were just a bit too aggressive, and they want to return to the old ways, and they want to turn Mandalorian society into one large crusade one large army. But unfortunately for the Mandalorians, in the age of the Republic, the warrior's way was dead. It simply led to zero economic growth. The Mandalorians needed to focus on building a society that wasn't constantly destroying itself and at war with other people. Many in Mandalorian society wanted or were open to this kind of reform and modernization. We just call it peace here on Earth, but yeah. Mandalorians. Pre Vizsla, the leader of the Death Watch in canon, would ultimately ally himself with the crime lord Maul in a desperate attempt to bring Mandalore back beneath his control. This, of course, leads to an honor duel in which Pre Vizsla loses the Darksaber to an outsider for the first time in Mandalorian history, and suddenly Mandalore is ruled by Maul. The Death Watch don't completely disappear after this very shameful event, but many view them as either a terrorist organization or a group of traitors. The new Mandalorians were a reactionary phenomenon to the devastation that Mandalorian culture had caused for thousands of years. It was quite a unique movement in Mandalorian history because the new Mandalorians were basically everything but Mandalorian and how they behaved and acted. It's like comparing the original Viking raiders from Scandinavia to modern Swedish people with their delicious meatballs and excellent quality of life. These new Mandos didn't wear helmets or armor. As a matter of fact, their leader, Duchess Satine, cries looked fabulous in a dress. She was also a pacifist. 
a pacifist who detractors would say was a pawn of the Republic and installed by Jedi agents during the Mandalorian Civil War. Yes, prior to the Clone Wars, the Mandalorians were in a civil war, which is honestly as common in their history as orbital bombardments and massacres of furry species. But yeah, the new Mandalorians won somehow, and there's not a lot of details about how this happened. But my belief has always been that the new Mandalorians won simply because of their numerical superiority. Just like the Swedes, a lot of the new Mandalorians realized that pillaging and raiding their neighbors was nowhere near as profitable as selling your neighbors cheap furniture and safe automobiles. Which makes a lot of sense because the Mandalorians were humans and, you know, humans, their natural setting is peace, stability, and social harmony. It's not exactly what we see out of the Mandalorians. To get Mandalorians, you actually need a lot of training and conditioning and traditions, and you need to teach the children at a young age how to be warriors, which of course creates a lot of trauma in many cases, which leads to crazy and ruthless organizations like the Death Watch. It was kind of inevitable that in Mandalorian history, you would eventually have a peace movement, a reactionary movement to all of the violence and everything. It just took a while because Mandalorians. But as in all things, people escaping one extreme oftentimes find themselves in another extreme. And Satine cries, despite her best intentions to keep Mandalore neutral during the Clone Wars, ultimately failed because her planet was placed in the crosshairs of one of the most powerful people in the galaxy, Darth Sidious. Mandalore would experience great trauma and economic loss during the Clone Wars, especially when the trade routes became unstable. A lot of essential goods had to be bought on the black market and shipped in through smugglers. Without support from the Republic or the Separatists, Mandalore would be targeted by Death Watch and its criminal allies. And although it was Death Watch's fault that the Mandalorians would be ruled by an outsider like Maul, it was also the new Mandalorians' fault for keeping their home planet so poorly defended in the first place. Okay, so now that we've gotten the two major factions out of the way, let's talk about some of the smaller factions that kind of exist within like their larger umbrella. First, we have the Children of the Watch, which is a subgroup of the Death Watch organization. This is the organization that Din Djarin belongs to, and it's one of the most fundamentalist organizations in the Mandalorian community. Many Mandalorians consider them to be religious zealots, and I would argue that they are correct. The Children of the Watch want to go back to the orthodox way of the Mandalore, like all the way back in the day. I mean, a lot of Earth religions also have, you know, like smaller groups within their larger religions who want to live as Muslims did back in the day, as Christians, as Jews. It's kind of like that. And so the Children on the Watch had some really strict rules, like for one, they weren't allowed to take their helmets off in the presence of others, which is why I imagine their heads smelled like what happens when you leave a Band-Aid on your finger for too long. Din Djarin became an apostate when he took his helmet off in front of a bunch of Imperial officers. I mean, even though he did shoot them all, he's still an apostate, so... According to Creed, one may only be redeemed in the living waters beneath the mines of Mandalore. Yeah, they got some pretty epic beliefs, and I think a lot of them have also become even more hardened believers after the Great Purge. Uh, of Mandalore, and that's because they were not there for that moment. They actually left mainstream Mandalorian society saying, oh, those guys are, you know, like Sodom and Gomorrah with their taking off their helmets and stuff like that, those goddamn liberals. And so they went, they went to uh, the moon of Concordia and they escaped all of this destruction, almost like a prophecy where they were saved. The Children of the Watch also put a huge emphasis on protecting and nurturing their youngest members. Following Mandalorian tradition, it wasn't uncommon for the Children of the Watch to adopt new members from the battlefield, usually recently orphaned children. These younglings were known as foundlings, and the entire tribe was expected to put their lives on the line protecting their future. As was the case with Din Djarin's tribe when they helped him protect Gogurt. When Maul challenges Pre Vizsla to a duel, he easily defeats the non-Force-sensitive Mandalorian and claims the title of Mandalore, along with the Darksaber. Most of the Death Watch adhere to tradition and bend knee to their new ruler. But one individual Bo-Katan cries, sister of Satin cries, refuses. She was all cool when, you know, the Death Watch were torturing people and shooting robots and just causing mayhem, as long as Pre Vizsla was in charge. 
But now that there's a non-Mandalorian, red, black face Zabrak in the throne, she and her mostly female cohorts would start another sub-faction known as the Night Owls. They would wage an asymmetrical campaign against Maul's government and would lead a Republic task force to retake Mandalore at the end of the Clone Wars. Unfortunately for Bo-Katan, the Republic would turn into the Empire, and the Empire wanted Bo-Katan to bend knee. She would refuse, and she would have to leave Mandalore once again. Eventually, the rebel Mandalorian Sabine Wren, who had the rightful claim to the Darksaber, gifts the weapon to Bo-Katan Cries, who uses it to unite her people against the Empire. She leads a successful revolt and retakes her planet, but the Empire retaliates with a massive bombing campaign which essentially destroys the surface of the planet. This is the event known as the Great Purge we mentioned before. Bo-Katan and her Night Owls survive this terrible massacre and will continue to fight the Empire, but many view her as a racist. I'm just kidding. There's many of you are as a cursed ruler, having lost Mandalore now twice. Now, there are three other minor factions, uh, Mandalorian factions, that I want to talk about. I don't think they'll be that important in this uh, new third season, but I want to talk about them because I kind of find them interesting. One is the Protectors. They serve as a non-aligned party within Mandalorian society. Their sole purpose was to protect the Mandalorian throne and their territory and tradition. Individuals like Fen Ra would mentor important Mandalorians like Sabine Wren. But the Protectors lack of political ambition meant that, you know, they didn't have that long of a staying power. They also were pretty small in number. Now, the second faction I want to talk about, which is now only uh, existing in Legends is the true Mandalorians. They were led by a man named Yester Muriel. He was a reactionary mercenary leader who sought to reform the Mandalorians by creating a code that could regulate their behavior while they were working as contractors. The idea here was to limit some of the more excessive parts of Mandalorian culture and tradition. You know, like the, the raping and the pillaging, the uh, hearing of the lamentation of the local women, and things like that. The whole idea was to present a better brand for future employees when they try to get more jobs. Yester Muriel was the mentor and savior of Jango Fett, who, like Din Djarin, was a foundling discovered on the battlefield as an orphan. In Legends, the true Mandalorians would be destroyed in a civil war with the Legends version of Death Watch. And while they no longer exist as an organization in the canon, I think a lot of like the traditions and values they had were kind of heroic and created kind of the more positive image of the Mandalorian. We're hopefully gonna see more in season three. And lastly, we have the Imperial Super Commandos faction. When bo refused to collaborate with the Empire, Gar Saxon and Tiber Saxon volunteered to be stewards of their planet on behalf of the Empire. These new Imperial Super Commandos were a disgrace to the Mandalorian people and they wore white Mandalorian armor while enforcing the Empire's dictates. So there you have it guys, those are all the factions within Mandalorian society. Um, let me know in the comment section below which one's your favorite. Hopefully in season three, we'll get a few new Mandalorian factions introduced to us. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button down below. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.